And without further ado, Research Practice Update in ITP and TTP with Alice Ma, MD, FACP. Dr. Ma, welcome. Thank you so much for being here today. My pleasure. So, Dr. Ma, I did not realize you're a, a graduate of the University of Michigan School of Medicine. So uh, I went uh, to I, my degree is from right down the road at Michigan State. Oh yeah. Well, luckily it's past football season, so we don't have oh, sorry. To, we <laughs> sorry. don't have to be talking talking trash at each other. There we go. There we go. So you and you served uh, your internal medicine residency and fellowship in hematology at the hospital of the University of Pennsylvania, and you've been on faculty at UNC since 1998. National, nationally and internationally known expert in a number of acquired and congenital bleeding disorders, and you've won numerous teaching awards and serve as the director of hematology oncology fellowship, as well as the hematologic block for medical students. So thank you so much for being here today. What's one thing we should know about you outside of, of your professional bio there? Oh, um, I love to travel and I haven't gone anywhere this year and getting itchy feet. Um, so uh, um, I love uh, being in places other than Chapel Hill. Um, so uh, that's my very favorite thing to do. Very good. Well, I, I hope that you're able to travel soon. I, I know a lot of folks are, are very ready to do so. Uh, let's see, we're, I mentioned poll everywhere. Uh, our first question that we always try to have kind of a softball at the beginning, ITP and TTP are blood disorders involving which part of the blood? A, plasma, B, red blood cells, C, white blood cells, D, platelets, and again, these are all anonymous, so we'll pop that up in, in just a minute, so you can go ahead and answer that, and uh, while you're getting ready to do that, this activity has been planned and implemented under the sole supervision of the course directors in association with the UNC Office of Continuing Professional Development. William Wood, MD, MPH, and CPD staff have no relevant financial relationships with commercial interests as defined by the ACCME. And Alice Ma, MD, FACP, has no financial relationships with commercial interests as defined by the ACCME. All right, and here's that first poll question. Uh, just take 10 or 15 seconds to go ahead and answer that. Thank you so much to everybody for jumping right in there and, and putting in your best guess. Uh, you may want to have a pencil or pen or, or some sort of notepad on your computer or phone where if you think of questions that you have for Dr. Ma during the presentation, jot those down and then you'll be able to submit those in, in Poll Everywhere at the end. All right, Dr. Ma, we seem to be landing on platelets with the, the majority of those who've answered. How are they doing? I think they're doing great. In fact, the answer is platelets. Um, but uh, the 11% who said red cells aren't wrong since TTP will also affect red cells as well. So good job. Great. And without further ado, update in ITP and TTP. I'll yep. let you take it away from here. Thank you. All right, so yes, I'd like to talk um, to give folks an update in ITP, which is immune thrombocytopenic purpura, and TTP, which is thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura. Yes. And so I do have a few disclosures, um, only that I have gotten money from these folks, but the, the money that I take from these folks is for my work in hemophilia, which will not uh, play into this uh, talk at all. Next. All right, so I like to start everything with a case. So a 33-year-old woman comes in with a new petechial rash and heavier than usual menstrual bleeding. She's otherwise been well. And she has no medical problems aside from seasonal allergies. She lives in North Carolina, so of course she has seasonal allergies. Her medicines include nasal steroids, uh, cetirizine, and an oral contraceptive, all of which are long-term medications. Um, and so there's been no change in any of her medicines. She has not recently been ill. Her physical examination shows normal vital signs. There's been no organomegaly, 
She's got scattered bruises and petechiae over her lower extremities. And when you look in her mouth, she has blood blisters in her mouth. So her CBC shows a platelet count of 8. Her hemoglobin is 12.8. Her NCV is 88. And her white count is 8.3. Her complete metabolic panel is completely normal. So liver, kidney, electrolytes, everything is all fine. Her TSH comes back normal. And on her peripheral blood smear, there are no schistocytes and no platelet clumping. Next. So the question I have for you all is how would you treat this patient? Would you give a milligram per kilogram of prednisone and admit for IVIG? Would you give her dexamethasone at 40 milligrams daily for four days and admit her for IVIG? Would you just give her prednisone at a milligram per kilogram or just dexamethasone at 40 milligrams per kilogram, uh, I'm sorry, 40 milligrams for four days? Or would you uh, give her a platelet transfusion? And we'll let you have some time uh, to, to vote. All right, that looks pretty stable. How are they doing? Oh, oh dear. So what I will say, yeah, why don't we close out the voting right now, um, is a couple of things about this woman. So the first thing is that her platelet count is below 10. And so at a platelet count less than 10, she is at a risk for a spontaneous intracranial hemorrhage. The second thing is that it is said, although I don't have the primary data, I've gone looking for it, I don't have it, but it is said that the presence of oral blood blisters, or what is called wet purpura, is felt to be the single most um, predictive finding for developing intracranial hemorrhage. And so because of that, we would add IVIG to the corticosteroids. So at this point, um, I would say either answer A or B would be what I would choose. And the, there are some data that seem to suggest that using dexamethasone instead of prednisone may enhance the speed of the response. And so because of that, I would vote with 7% uh, of those of you who chose the answer and give dexamethasone um, at 40 milligrams per kilogram and admit this woman for IVIG. Now, the 23% of those who chose a platelet transfusion Platelet transfusions in ITP are a, little, are a little iffy. We give platelet transfusions only if the patient is having significant bleeding. And the reason is that a transfused platelet is going to be attacked by the patient's own immunoglobulins in the same way that the patient's own platelet count is. And so giving a platelet transfusion is not going to raise the platelet count, that those platelets are essentially going to be wasted and destroyed pretty rapidly by the patient's own immune system. The only time we would give a platelet transfusion is in the setting of ongoing, um, pretty severe bleeding, in which case um, you could use a platelet um, transfusion to uh, temporarily help with the bleeding, realizing that it's not going to increase um, the platelet count um, per se. Okay, next slide. So ITP is immune-mediated platelet destruction. We uh, like to break it up into primary ITP versus secondary, and so secondary causes can include drug-induced ITP, other uh, ITP associated with other immune conditions like lupus, 
or rheumatoid arthritis. Um, there are lymphoproliferative disorders, the um, Hodgkin's and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Hi, um, that's it. Hello? Um, also, CLL that can be associated with um, ITP. And then immunocompromised states. So HIV is certainly associated with ITP. And in fact, um, H uh, ITP can be a harbinger of HIV infection and can occur well before the patient has a single um, um, opportunistic infection. And then CVID, or common variable immune deficiency, is an immunodeficiency that is relatively mild, may not be um, diagnosed until the patient is an adult. And the immunodeficiency is also associated with an immunodysregulation, and so other autoimmune conditions can crop up. Viral illnesses such as hepatitis C and, again, HIV can be associated with ITP, and pregnancy can induce um, an ITP. Importantly, there is no diagnostic test for ITP. There, um, you can try to send antiplatelet antibodies, but they have a sensitivity and a specificity of about 60%, and so it's as good and maybe a little better than just a coin flip. So it's expensive, and don't, we don't use those tests. The first-line therapy, as we talked about, is corticosteroids plus or minus IVIG. Again, IVIG is reserved for patients who are actively bleeding or patients in whom you really want to push the platelet count up sooner. Steroids work in about 48 to 72 hours, and IVIG can push the response to uh, somewhere around uh, 24 hours. So IVIG um, gives you a more rapid response. Second-line therapy can include rituximab, the thrombopoietin receptor agonists, and splenectomy. Okay. And so I want to talk a little bit about the ASH um, ITP guidelines that were released in 2019 and published last year. Um, this is an update of the 2011 ITP guidelines. Next. And so rather than giving you, reading you all of the guidelines um, uh, in order, which is really boring, I'm going to give a few takeaways. So the first one is, that says, hey, you've got an adult with newly diagnosed IDP and the platelet count is less than 20. The guideline says, hey, maybe it's going to suggest that maybe you admit the person to start therapy rather than managing them as an outpatient. At UNC, you might want to call the coagulation attending on call to ex expedite an appointment. So you can call the UNC operator and ask for the coagulation attending. Next. The next takeaway is how you treat patients who are corticosteroid dependent, as in you try to taper the steroids um, and they keep relapsing, or patients have no response to corticosteroids. So now you need to move to second-line therapy. So in adults with ITP that has lasted more than three months, who are either corticosteroid-dependent or don't have a response, the ASH guideline says you could either do splenectomy or a TPO receptor agonist. So they're putting those two as equivalent. However, the guidelines also say they would prefer rituximab over splenectomy, and then further, they would prefer a TPO receptor agonist rather than rituximab. And it's that last one that I want to highlight because I notice that in the community, folks are really using, are jumping to rituximab over the TPO receptor agonists but because of the side effect profile of rituximab, including potentially neutropenia, um, they're, they're suggesting that we use TPO receptor agonists, um, and long-term use of those seems to be more uh, associated with uh, patients sliding in to a remission. 
So interestingly, this uh, guideline group recommends then in order a TPO receptor agonist rather than rituxan, um, uh, and then they would do that over a splenectomy. All right, next. So uh, in a different case, I had a man who's 24. He's had a history of ITP since childhood, and he has been maintained on l trombopeg uh, 75 milligrams a day, so that's the maximum dose for the past seven years. So I got him when he was about 20, when he finally transitioned away from my pediatric colleagues. His platelet count varies between 10, which is not good, and 60. Um, he is variably adherent to the l trombopeg diet. And for those of you who aren't real aficionados, l trombopeg has to be taken on an empty stomach, completely empty. And it cannot be taken around any dairy. So you need to take it two hours after you've had any dairy, or you have to wait an hour before you can have any dairy. And that includes cream with your coffee. So this is a really hard diet to try to adhere to, especially for this guy, since his favorite foods are milk, cheese, and ice cream. In fact, the first time I saw this patient, I saw him with a fellow, his platelet count, the patient's platelet count was 14, and the, my fellow was ready to jump in and start a different therapy. But when I went in and talked to the patient, um, it turns out he was actually washing down his l trombopeg pills with an Oreo McFlurry pretty much every day. Now, you can argue about exactly how much dairy is in an Oreo McFlurry, but it was enough to keep his platelet count suboptimal. When this guy is really good about his diet, his platelet count is closer to 100. Now, in the past, he had failed rituximab, he had failed vincristin, and he had also failed splenectomy. So this is a guy who's reasonably refractory. Next slide. So with that, I wanted to talk a little bit about a different agent um, and the British Journal of Hematology uh, had reported on a phase three randomized study of avatrombopeg, which is a novel thrombopoietin receptor agonist uh, for the treatment of chronic IGP. Next slide. So this um, avatrombopeg um, has recently been approved for chronic ITP in June of 2019. The adverse events um, associated included headache, contusion, upper respiratory tract infection, arthralgias, epistaxis, fatigue, gingival bleeding, and petechiae. All of those um, were all comparable with or in fact lower than placebo. So avatrombopeg notably has fewer uh, drug food effects, and there may be reportedly uh, fewer AEs than L-trombopeg. So in fact, avatrombopeg you want to take with some food in your stomach to improve your, um, uh, uh, to improve the absorption. And there's no problems with taking avatrombopeg with dairy. Next slide. So the way you do this is um, you, uh, down at the bottom, the bottom chart, you measure, this is from the package insert, you measure platelet counts every two weeks, and depending on where the platelet count is, you can make a dosage uh, adjustment. And the dosage adjustment, you start at 20 milligrams once a day, and then if you need to go down, you can go down to 20 milligrams three times a week, or once a week, or, uh, or twice a week, or once a week. Um, and if you have to go up, you go 20 milligrams and 40 milligrams alternating, and you top out at 40 milligrams once a day. So this guy has been on 20 milligrams uh, once a day for his um, platelet counts uh, for his IGP, and he has had a beautiful platelet count, completely invariable. Um, and his quality of life has improved because he can have just as much ice cream, milk, and cheese as he would like. Next slide. 
All right, I'm going to move, switch gears here and talk about a different patient. So this is a 32-year-old woman. She has zero past medical history, and she comes in with fever, worsening confusion, and belly pain of two days duration. She has noticed some darkening urine and some new bruises. On physical exam, she's confused. She's got some involuntary abdominal guarding. She's febrile and a little tachycardic. And she has some mild jaundice and scleroliptus and a few scattered bruises. On laboratory data, she has a hemoglobin of 8.2, a white count of 9.4, a platelet count of 22. Her BUN is elevated at 41. Her creatinine is up to 1.5. Her LDH is a whopping 2200, and her total bilirubin is 2.1. And her peripheral blood smear shows schistocytes. Next slide. So let's take another poll at this point. What would you do next to manage this woman? Would you do plasma exchange? Would you start steroids and IVIG? Would you give a platelet transfusion? Would you infuse FFP? Or would you tech an Adam TS13 level? All right, maybe take just another five seconds or so if you haven't had a chance to respond yet. Thank you. Okay, why don't we close out the poll? So this woman is likely to have TTP, but you can't know that for sure. And so um, the folks who chose plasma exchange She's got all the hallmarks of TTP, and so starting plasma exchange while you're waiting for some extra data to come back is, is exactly the correct answer. Um, you could start steroids. You might not want to use IVIG. This is not ITP because the patient has schistocytes on her smear. And so I wouldn't use steroids in IVIG, certainly not alone. Platelet transfusions, the people who voted for that are not correct. And in fact, if you give a person with TTP a platelet transfusion, you are likely to cause significant harm and or death. And that's why you have to look at the smear, look for schistocytes. You have to think, wow, this lady might have TTP. And you have to avoid a platelet transfusion. Now, this woman has neurologic compromise. You will, if, you, if, there is a, if this person is living at a hospital which does not have the capacity to do plasma exchange right away, and most hospitals don't, so you're waiting to try to get the patient uh, to a tertiary center, UNC, Duke, ECU, um, Moses Cone, um, uh, the Charlotte, the big hospitals in Charlotte. Well, if you're waiting to get to those centers, um, and we have had some really busy hospitals, uh, busy uh, days recently, our hospital has been full, and it's, there have been delays in a prompt transfer. It is not, it is in fact quite acceptable, and in fact it is desired to give the patient fresh frozen plasma as a source of Adam TS13. And so in addition, even if this woman had lived in Chapel Hill, if she's in our ER and she's having neurologic compromise, if there's going to be a delay in getting a dial temporary dialysis catheter placed in her neck, we might also give her some FFP quickly. We would slam it in. Um, to try to improve some of her neurologic compromise. And we would send an Adam TS13 level, but unless you have it available on site, um, you, it might take a week to get back. 
So you want to send it, but it's not going to be back in time. So we would send the Atom TS13 level and start plasma exchange and potentially FFP infusions. Okay, next slide. So again, if you're not sure if it's TTP, you can calculate a plasmic score. So Dr. Bendapundi in 2017 um, published in The Lancet Hematology a clinical prediction score called the plasmic score that is um, designed to try to help practitioners decide if their patient is likely to have severe Adam TS13 deficiency, which is associated with TTP. So this was derived from a consortium of patients from multi-centers, and it was then validated externally using a data set assembled at a different institution to make sure that there was no cross-contamination. So this scoring system used historical and laboratory variables that would be obtainable rapidly across a wide range of clinical settings. Next slide. So um, in this publication, they took 647 patients who had undergone Adam TS13 testing. 93 got excluded because they weren't thrombocytopenic. 142 were excluded because they didn't have schistocytes. 19 were excluded because they didn't have all the data they needed. And 25 were excluded for other reasons. So we ended up with 368 patients in the analysis. 214 were in the derivation cohort, and they went ahead and looked at a different 154 for the internal validation cohort. So they developed the plasmic score, and then they tested it. 200 um, tested in the derivation cohort, and 150 in the internal validation cohort. Next slide. So what is in the plasmic score? So it's a platelet count that's below 30. It, it looks at hemolysis. So what do we need for hemolysis? It's a reticulocyte count greater than two and a half, or an undetectable haptoglobin, or an indirect bilirubin that's greater than two. It requires you to have no active cancer that gives you a point, and no history of either a solid organ or a stem cell transplant. That gives you another point. And that's because either cancer or transplant can give you schistocytes um, and can sometimes be associated with low platelets. So if you don't have those things, it's more likely that you're going to have TTP. They want you to have a low MCV. And that's because schistocytes are small. And additionally, B12 deficiency can give you some schistocytes and can present with hemolysis and thrombocytopenia. So, but B12 deficiency is really macrocytic. So the MCV is high. So a low MCV gives you another point. You also don't want the patient to be in DIC, and so you want their INR to be less than one and a half. That gives you a point. And then you don't want the creatinine to be whompingly high because that's more likely to pre, uh, be hem the hemolytic uremic syndrome or HUS. And so with that, a creatinine of less than two gives you one point on the plasmic score. Now, most of these labs will, or, and variables will be accessible at, hosp at, um, at less than tertiary care hospitals. Although when we, more recently, we have been noticing that uh, some smaller institutions don't have the availability of a haptoglobin or an indirect bilirubin um, from, or a reticulocyte count from the emergency room. Um, and so that help, that, that um, gives us, that hampers us when we're trying to um, calculate the plasmid score. So if you total this all up, a plasmic score of 0 to 4 is pretty low risk. And so that's when we found severe Adam TS13, 
uh, like somewhere between zero and four percent of folks with severe Adam GS13 had a low plasma score. A score of five is going to give you an intermediate risk, somewhere between five and 24 percent. And a score of six or seven gives you a high risk of having a severe Adam TS13 deficiency. Um, so that's um, somewhere around two thirds to over 80 percent. Next slide. So this was subsequently validated in a different in a different study with different um, co-authors. And so uh, Dr. Lee and colleagues looked at 112 patients, and um, and it turns out that the ad, that the plasmid score also performed well in this validation cohort. Next slide. In this, um, what you can see, if you look over at the far right, 72% um, of those with a high-risk plasmic score also had severe Adam TS13. And if you look very, uh, if you look down um, at the very left, 0% um, of folks with severe Adam TS13 had a low-risk score. And so that um, is a really nice uh, validation of the plasmic score. Next slide. Oh, skip this one too. Next. What is interesting is when you look at the Kaplan-Meier curve um, and looked at the survival by plasmic score and plasmic exchange, the top curve um, where you have a, essentially 100% survival, that is for patients with a very high plasmic score who underwent plasma exchange. And so that is, if you have TTP, if it's likely that you have TTP with a high plasmic score and you got plasma exchange, then you did well. Now, if you didn't have a high plasmic score, then it was more likely that you had a transplant or active malignancy or DIC. And for that reason, um, your survival was less. Next slide. So this patient um, is uh, given a plasmic score of seven, so high, high, high. And so we institute plasma exchange. Her Adam TS13 level comes back at less than 5%. So it is undetectable. And the patient initially starts to respond clinically to plasma exchange, but her platelet count plateaus. And then it starts falling. And she is now becoming refractory to plasma exchange. So next, what would you do next in her management? So it looks like she's got refractory TTP. Would you start rituximab, which is answer A? Would you increase the volume of plasma exchange? Would you increase um, the patient's prednisone dose? Would you give some vincristin and start some vincristin? Or would you start caplicizumab? And if you would just take about five more seconds, go ahead and, and uh, submit an answer. Again, all anonymous. Okay, let's close the poll. And I would say that it is, um, that starting rituximab is a very reasonable thing and things, and certainly we have done that at UNC. Um, we would likely treat the patient with rituximab right after she got her, right after she finished her plasma exchange. Um, but sometimes starting it early can give you a head start on getting rid of the antibody to ADAMGS13. Um, remember that when you start rituximab, it's going to, you have to coordinate that with the people who do your plasma exchange. So you'll do the plasma exchange um, and then hurry up and give the rituximab, and then wait as long as you can the next day 
and do your plasma exchange as close to the end of the day as you can to give the rituximab as long of a time in the circulation as you possibly can because plasma exchange is going to suck out some of the rituxan that you've just given. Some people actually will go ahead and increase the volume of plasma exchanges. So instead of one and a half plasma volumes, they might go to two plasma volumes. And some people have actually gone to do twice daily plasma exchange. Um, that's not something we typically do at UNC, but other centers have certainly done that. Increasing prednisone more than the one milligram per kilogram is probably not going to give you much bang for your clinical buck um, and probably increase the chance that she's going to have worse mental status changes um, considering that she's in the ICU. Vincristin is an oldie but goodie in this scenario. We have certainly used it. I have used it to good effect. Um, you give a milligram or two of Vincristin, um, and sometimes that stops the platelets uh, from going down quite as much. Um, but those of you who started cap who would vote for starting caplicizumab um, have uh, have really hit on what is the newest therapeutic uh, maneuver in our in our in our armamentarium. Next slide. And so caplicizumab was present was uh, presented in the New England Journal in two studies. The first one was the Titan study um, in 2016, and that was the phase two study. Next slide. Um, and caplicizumab is the agent that is going to stop the Adam TS13 target, which is von Willebrand's factor, from binding to the platelets. And so it um, prevents platelet von Willebrand factor interactions and thereby prevents the platelets from being cleared and the microthrombi from forming. Now, notably, it will not get rid of the inhibitor, it's, so it's not an immunosuppressant. It's not messing with the underlying immuno, uh, uh, autoimmune condition. It's just blocking that final common pathway at which TTP causes damage. So caplicizumab in and of itself will not cure your TTP. You have to give it in conjunction with an immunosuppressing agent. Okay, next slide. So this was time to confirmed normalization of the platelet count, and the blue line is patients treated with caplicizumab. They were given caplicizumab um, prior to plasma exchange and prior to randomization, and the red line, solid line, is folks who got caplicizumab, I'm sorry, got placebo um, prior to randomization. And what you can see is that caplicizumab really improved the time to platelet normalization by a couple of days. Next slide. And what you can see here is that it patients treated with caplicizumab in the left panel compared to patients with placebo had fewer exacerbations um, but did not change the number of relapses. So again, this is, at, this is caplicizumab without immunosuppression. So it prevents the early exacerbations, but unless you treat it with um, immunosuppressants, you're not going to get, you're not going to prevent relapses. Next slide. Um, and so here in the Titan phase 1-2 trial, caplicizumab induced a faster resolution of the acute TTP episode, and it was maintained during the treatment period, but there was an increased tendency towards bleeding, and there was also an increased tendency towards relapse. Next slide. So the, with that, the investigators went on to do a second study known as their Hercules trial, and this was a phase three trial. Next slide. And um, next slide. 
And so um, here they compared placebo in the red line with capleizumab. And again, it showed an improvement in the time to normalization of the platelet count. Next slide. And um, and uh, what we didn't, what I didn't show you, is it in, is it improved the number of days that patients had to be on plasma exchange. So it got people out of the hospital faster, and it got them off plasma exchange faster. There was a hint, not a full bo blo full bore. Um, effect, but a hint of an effect that it may improve mortality. Okay, so why don't we put everyone on caplicizumab? And the answer is that it is unbelievably expensive. It is $270,000 per course. And so with that, these investigators from this blood paper asked is caplicizumab plus standard of care versus standard of care, is it cost effective? And so this is cost effectiveness analysis over the five-year horizon. And it looked at caplicizumab arm on the left versus standard of care. And on the caplicizumab arm, what you're looking at is the length of stay, the cost of the length of stay, plus the therapeutic plasma exchange plus rituximab, and that all totals up to uh, not quite $56,000. And then caplicizumab, which is $270,000, versus in the standard of care arm over on the right-hand side, the length of stay, therapeutic plasma exchange, and rituxan, that was more expensive because the patients were in the hospital longer. And what you can see is even when you project out to five years, um, even considering that they're, um, that adding the rituxan blocks the uh, um, relapse rate, the um, ICER is still one and a half million dollars to say that caplicizumab is not cost effective. Um, so we are having a huge dispute in hematology about this. So the way the clinical trial was done was to take caplicizumab and start caplicizumab even before plasma exchange started. And everyone gets it. And so in Europe, where caplicizumab is approved, um, and there's no private insurance, when in countries where it's approved, everyone with TTP just gets caplicizumab. In the U.S., where we've got to worry about co-pays and drug costs and, um, and whether or not insurance will provide um, approval for this very expensive agent, the question is, is buying a day or two less of plasma exchange enough for the insurance companies to approve it? And the answer is certainly not in all comers. Now, is it enough for hematologists to use it in everyone? The answer is probably not. So we are trying to figure out where would we use caplicizumab. And again, already we're using it off-label because we're not giving it to everyone right up front. Now, who would I give it to up front? And the answer is, I might have given it to this lady up front because she's presenting with severe neurologic deficits and, pro and neurologic symptoms. And I might say, start CAPLA in someone having neurologic issues. Start CAPLA in someone who's having cardiac issues. And then maybe reserve caplicizumab off-label for someone who's got refractory disease or relapsing disease as a way to wait until the immunosuppression can fully kick in. Again, this is a very nuanced discussion because, and we have to be nuanced because we're talking about money versus life. So next slide. 
And then lastly, um, this is kind of a, a busy uh, case, but it's a representative case. So you have a 66-year-old woman. She's got two weeks of easy bruising and, no, and epistaxis. She's got COPD. She's mildly cognitively impaired. She's got essential hypertension. And her platelet count is 7,000. She gets diagnosed with ITP. Now, on admission, she's on salmuterol, fluticasone, hydrochlorothiazide, lisinopril, and amlodipine. She lives by herself. Her daughter is two hours away but comes in on the weekends because her mom can't remember her medicines. The patient's super anxious about starting any new drugs, and she's worried about side effects. She's had three hospitalizations for COPD exacerbation, but she's never been in the ICU. She's never been intubated. So the medical team is talking with this lady about dexamethasone, 40 milligrams a day. But the patient and her daughter say, oh my gosh, this is going to give her really, really bad confusion. The patient had been on dexamethasone for a COPD exacerbation last year. But she's been on prednisone. That's been okay. And so now we're going to give her IVIG and a prednisone taper over four to eight weeks starting at a milligram per kilogram per day. Next slide. So I want to spend the last little bit of time talking about risk factors for infection. Um, and so what we are not super good about is thinking about the risks of infection and adequately prophylaxing our patients before starting them on long-term um, immunosuppressant agents. So patient factors include age, comorbidities, concomitant medications, and socioeconomic factors, including living alone, their degree of insurance, how can they get transportation to and from the doctor. And then there are disease and treatment factors, including what they're getting, what agents, what dose, how long, time to initiation of therapy, and the number of lines of treatment that they've needed before they've been um, got before they've uh, gotten to this particular line of therapy. Next slide. And so, with this, I'm going to highlight one of uh, two of my colleagues, Luis uh, Malpica Castillo, who was a former fellow, now an assistant professor at MD Anderson, and Stefan Mall, whom you might have known. He is my clotting uh, thrombosis colleague. But they uh, together wrote a very nice paper and presented at ASH last year about a practical approach to monitoring and prevention of infectious complications that are associated with systemic corticosteroids, antimetabolites, cyclosporin, and cyclophosphamide in patients who are receiving these for non-malignant hematologic diseases, including ITP and TTP. Next slide. So obviously, what, what do we do? We want to recommend good hygiene for the hands, managing how to manage a febrile illness, early management of animal bites, which is really important if patients are, um, have undergone splenectomy, avoidance of mosquito and tick-borne illnesses, um, things around travel, HIV screening, and, immuno, uh, and immunizations including um, getting the annual flu vaccine and the herpes zoster vaccine, and then, uh, live, and then noticing that either live or live attenuated vaccines are contraindicated in patients who are getting immunosuppressive therapies. Um, we really want to try to avoid those um, until a, more than a month after discontinuation of immunosuppression. Next slide. So how do we prophylax against PJP? So the risk factors are a steroid dose of, more, of 30 or more prednisone equivalents for more than four weeks, or steroids between 15 and 30 um, for more than eight weeks, or combination of medium-dose steroids, um, or steroids more than 10 prednisone equivalents, and age, coexisting lung disease, or other immunosuppression. Next slide. There's a risk for zoster, and, um, and the, the recommendations for immunizations 
and you know, antimicrobial prophylaxis are listed here. Next slide. Um, I do want to speak a little bit about strongyloides. Many of our patients in North Carolina have come from places um, such as Africa or Central or South America um, where strongyloides is epidemic. And what we know is that anyone coming from a high-risk area who's scheduled to start corticosteroids at more then 10, prednisone of 10 milligrams of prednisone a day for more than a month should be screened um, for strongyloides because of the risk of strongyloides hyperinfection. Next slide. You also want to worry about hepatitis B reactivation. And um, in a slide I'll present later, I do want to make sure that you check for hepatitis B status before you give rituximab, because rituxan can lead to hep B reactivation. But you also want to check for hepatitis B before you give IVIG, because the IVIG can give you a false positive um, for uh, hepatitis um, IgM um, core antibody serologies. Next slide. And then there are risks associated, and then um, the next several slides talk about different risks associated with different immunosuppressive agents, and so, and, and it talks about the infectious risks as well as the management strategies. So these are infectious risks associated with either azathioprine or my, um, mycophenolate. Next slide. And then there are infectious complications associated with cyclosporin. And then lastly, there are infectious complications associated with cyclophosphamide, and the management strategies are listed on this slide. These slides are, of course, available um, on our website, um, and I also gave you the source document from which we've taken these. Next slide. So I want to finish with three um, sets of clinical tips, so uh, especially for ITP. So again, before starting IVIG, please get your hepatitis B serologies in case the patient needs rituxan. Um, and so that way we can avoid giving them a year's worth of um, entecavir uh, to treat the hepatitis B that they never had to begin with. Next slide. Also, before giving rituxan, please make sure your patient has been vaccinated. Rituxan is going to block vaccine efficacy for six months, and so will make splenectomy, if needed, less safe. And this may also make a COVID vaccine less effective. So currently, I am doing a lot to try to not give rituximab until after my patient has gotten a COVID vaccine. And so I'm using, in ITP, I'm using a lot more thrombopoietin receptor agonists and a lot less rituxan. The vaccines needed are listed here. You need the pneumococcal vaccine. You need two of them, the uh, 13 conjugate Prevnar, followed eight weeks later by the 23 con um, um, conjugate uh, pneumovax. And then meningococcus, you need two. You need the meningococcal conjugate, and then you need the one specifically against serogroup B. So you need Menactra and Vexero. And then you only need one against Haemophilus influenzae, and that's the Hib polyconjugate. Next slide. And then the other thing I want to say is when you're using Romipilstim, um, trade name end plate, Please use the dosing algorithm that's in the package insert. Don't give the full vial and then wait to see what happens. Um, I think a lot of insurance companies will reimburse you if you have to waste drug. Um, and this way, it'll avoid the super high levels followed by the super low levels that you um, end up using. And so give just the right amount to keep the platelet count at 50,000 or so. All right, with that, I'm going to stop, and I'm happy to take any questions.
All right, Dr. Ma, thank you so much. Um, let's see, I think we should have one that just came in already. Um, is there a role for uh, Ramaphosin and for, IT, for ITP? And there we go. And apologies for the pronunciation. Yes. Is there a role for Romipolstin and ITP? Absolutely. And so Romipolstin is a thrombopoietin receptor agonist. Um, it absolutely plays a role. It is a painful role because it's given once a week in the patients um, in a healthcare setting. So we use this in patients whose insurance doesn't cover an oral agent, um, harumph. Um, I'm glad to see the next question about can patients with ITP receive the COVID-19 vaccine? And we are seeing this question blow up our um, healthcare lines. And so there was a single report in that excellent medical journal, The New York Times, that talked about one healthcare individual without a history of ITP who got the COVID vaccine and got ITP, developed severe ITP, and actually died of a head bleed. So because of that, anyone who has anything to do with platelets has been petrified. And so I would refer you all to the PDSA, Platelet Disorder Support Association website, where expert opinion has said, really and truly, if you've never had ITP before, take your COVID vaccine. If you have a history of ITP, check your platelet count and check with your provider. Um, we do recommend the COVID vaccine, um, but we want to watch platelet counts right after you get the vaccine. Um, there is... Um, a TPO agonist, we've used them long term. They have been safe. Some patients go into remission, um, and it becomes evident when they are going into remission because their platelet counts start to go up. We start to taper the dose, and their platelet counts remain. We don't know the long term effect on the marrow. There may be a hint that some patients rarely will develop um, myelofibrosis, although we also know that patients with ITP long-term can develop a fibrotic marrow. So it's not clear the impact of the TPO agonists. Ah, yes, so PDSA did a great webinar two days ago addressing the vaccines and ITP. Again, they were responding to that New, England, uh, to that New York Times article. Mycophenolate is great for ITP. It is my secondary go-to medicine. And there was a recent review, uh, I'm sorry, a recent abstract at ASH uh, that talked about mycophenolate plus corticosteroids up front for treatment of ITP seeming to have a bigger, um, um, a bigger uh, impact in terms of people staying in remission. Um, I'd like to see that data re uh, replicated. And then ITP's post-stem cell transplant, um, no, I don't have a lot of recommendations except to say try really hard not to kill the graft um, and use, um, and we've used uh, TPO agonists. Rarely has a platelet count of above 20. Um, I would say maybe consider a different TPO agonist um, or potentially um, using them synergistically, so end plate plus another TPO agonist, such as l peg or avatrombopeg. All right, and I think we, we are running out of time, so we're going to leave it there with the questions. I want to thank our audience. Wow, those were a lot of, of great questions. Um, I've got a few other thank yous. We want to thank uh, all of, of North Carolina for their generous support through their taxpayer dollars of the University Cancer Research Fund and the, UNC, and the uh, Lineberger Cancer Network, the UNC Lineberger Cancer Network, and the Lineberger Comprehensive Cancer Center. So many thank yous. Uh, we also want to thank uh, Mary King, Veneranda Obore, and John Powell for all of the hard work they do for each of these lectures. So thank you to them as well.